The Newbery Medal isn't about my book or any book. It's about the invisible fellowship of librarians, publishers, parents, teachers, and writers who want to give their best to children. The Newbery Medal is a symbol of our communion. We are threaded together by our commitment to children and the life of the mind. We dance together on one string. And now it is time to say thank you and to try to say it simply, purely. Thank you for coming here tonight, for being readers, for knowing that children and books matter. Thank you, my parents, for opening the world of books to me. Thank you, my friends from the Park School, for helping me write and for helping me rejoice. And last of all, thank you, members of the Newberry Committee, for feeding my bears and granting me my heart's desire. On the morning of the best day of her life, Maud Flynn was locked in the outhouse singing the Battle Hymn of the Republic. She was locked in because she was being punished. The Barbary Asylum for Female Orphans was overcrowded. Every room in the wide brick building was in use. There were few places where one could imprison a child who had misbehaved. Maud had a hazy idea that the Battle Hymn had something to do with war. I I started writing stories pretty early. Um, by fifth grade, I, I was taking little packets of paper out on the playground at recess. I know I did some writing in fourth grade, and hmm. I guess probably around third. Do you remember what you were reading then, and, and was that sort of... I mean, yeah, of course I copied what I read. I mean, that's all I have. Yeah, I and of course, very long time. you know, like my, my childhood poetry, a lot of it is quite didactic because that's what I was reading. Of course. You know, so I would write these little moral poems about, you know. The way to behave. Yeah. yeah. What a good, good girl does. Yeah. Yeah. I think my parents were just about perfect hmm. because when I showed them something I'd written, they were pretty much thrilled with it. They loved it. Um, and then they sort of forgot about it. Oh, that seems right. And I, I you know, I, I sometimes... They didn't frame it and put it up and... No. Right to or, you know, talk about revising it or deciding that I was so special Submit that I had to, to take contest. a course mm -hmm. and, you know, or that I needed to be published. They just, you know, they were thrilled with it and... Uh, and then we went on with our lives. Mm. Although I do remember with some amusement um, going to my parents once. It was the first time I'd finished something, and I think it was around fourth grade, and it was this um, story about this black pig that was shipwrecked on a desert island with an impertinent goat. And, uh, you know, I finally finished something. You know, and it had illustrations because I could put the stuffed animals on the page and draw around them. <laughs> so they were better pictures than I could have drawn freehand. And I wanted to read it to my parents, and they didn't, they were busy. Oh. You know, and I, I, I just came into my room and threw a fit and wept, you know, and went back to them and stormed and said I had, I had worked on these characters, <laughs> I had molded them like statues. You know, I remember saying An that, I had, goat. that I had... I had, you know, I had shaped them like statues, and uh, you know, they they were they were contrite and they came, oh. you know, not right away because they didn't want to watch finish watching it, but you know, when they came in, it was like okay, now, you know, we um, oh, now we're ready sweet. to hear, and they liked the story. Oh. Mm -hmm. Wow! And Mrs. Pig says to the babysitter, "If you feel like having something to eat later on in the oh. evening, you just go right ahead." Oh, and wow. Mrs. Wolf, the babysitter, says, thank you, I shall. I didn't learn to finish anything until I was in my late 20s. I just wrote beginnings all the time, beginnings, beginnings, beginnings. I just couldn't finish anything. Huh. And that's something that I always tell young writers because um, my inability to finish anything made me feel like I'd never really be a writer. Huh. But I was teaching myself to write. Yeah. And I was teaching myself to write. And of course, middles are hell. If you can no, get the sorry. middle right, I know. you know, the ending will take care of itself, but the, the middle is just a swamp. I don't know anybody who, who writes who doesn't think that this stuff is outside. You yeah. know, it's that muse thing. It's, yep. you know, that it's, and it's, it's true, you don't get, you know, you, sometimes you just pull the same, you know, boring stuff out, and that's easy to recognize as yourself. 
But then every now and then there's something that's startling and... Does that and, feel like a gift? Yeah, yeah. and mysterious. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's when you've got hold of something. And I think people go nuts because they don't have any control. Hmm. You know, and they don't, you know, where's the next idea coming from? You know, I, I just finished a big book and, and I don't think I'm ever going to think of anything else again. <clears throat> I'm thinking about um, the Night Fairy mm -hmm. and um, looking out that window and I'm thinking to myself that the setting of, I'm wondering about the setting of the Night Fairy. Oh, absolutely. It's my backyard. Yeah. When I first came here, um, I took pictures in the backyard and I lost the photograph, but one of the photographs had this strange bright blot in midair. And people would say, what was it? And I'd say, it's a fairy. And they'd say, it's not a fairy. And I'd say, well then what is it? <laughs> and I, I suppose the first, you know, this was the first time I, uh, since childhood, that I had a little bit of land, so I really watched the garden and I've had raccoons and possums and woodchucks. I thought I'll, I'll set it out back and then I thought well why would a fairy live that close to human beings you know with all our telephone wires mm -hmm. and you know magnetic fields and you needed a situation. Rubbish. And so well because maybe she couldn't get away and why couldn't she get away well what if her wings came off. But of course I was in the middle of splendors and glooms when I wrote The Night Fairy. I don't know if I knew that. Yeah, it was the summer. It just we had, popped out? We had to, um, I was stuck. I didn't know what I was doing. And it was the summer we were renovating the library. So I knew I'd end up um, moving the books. And so I thought, well, maybe I'll take a little time off Splendors and write something wow. short that I can finish in the summer. So that was that was part of that. Did it come, did you finish it in the summer? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's great. Look inside. And, and sometimes, like if you look at this, you know, this is in our picture book section. You know, it looks, you know, open it up and you think, oh, those are nice pictures. But if you read a page or two, sometimes we climb to the place Mama loved best with our blueberry buckets and a chair for my grandmother, to the blueberry barren where no trees grew, the sky an arm's length away, where marsh hawks skimmed over the land and bears came to eat fruit, and wild turkeys left footprints for us to find. So, Everybody I talk to um, at Park has a really interesting sort of story about how they got there. How did you come to Park? I came to Park doing children's theater. You know, I was, I was with Children's Theater Association. We went from school to school to school. And we were doing The Secret Garden with Cornelia Cody. And I got to Park and we got laughs where we, that we never had before. The visual humor. Uh, not oh. always got laughs, but we got the verbal humor. Mm -hmm. The verbal humor got laughs. And I looked at the wonderful artwork and the hall. And I looked at the bathrooms. Because whenever you, you know, we, we went to lots of schools where the, the bathrooms were filthy and there was no hot water and, and there were no paper towels and children were clearly being treated like animals. Hmm. And I looked at this artwork and, um, and I, I, looked at the kids and I thought I'd like to work here. Hmm. Oscar Wilde, when I was in high school, which I deeply loathed, um, hmm. I came across Oscar Wilde and I read a lot of Oscar Wilde and, and one of the things he said was that schools should be so beautiful, such wonderful places that that the worst thing a child would could imagine would be to not be able to go to school. And I that was always, I would have loved Park. And, um, I, you know, I had been a children's librarian at Enoch Pratt Free Library for eight years, and then I'd worked for Baltimore County, so I did no library work. Mm -hmm. well, I kept an eye out for jobs in admissions, because I didn't have a teaching degree or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And um, I applied for admissions, and I was very lucky not to have been hired, because, you know, with admissions I'd have to maintain a certain dignity, I wouldn't be able to sit on the floor. Mm -hmm. And, um, whereas... I find it quite possible to be extremely honest with Park students. And undignified. Yes, very undignified. <laughs> My grandfather's barn is sweet smelling and dark and cool. Leather harnesses hang like paintings against old wood, and hay dust floats like gold in the air. And you know what? I'm losing you. You know why I'm losing you? Because this doesn't have a story. 
This has got interesting language. It's a mood piece. It's all about different places. So I, I sort of, and, and then there was an opening for a librarian. The school year had already begun. And uh, what, year, what year was this? I think it was 91. Uh -huh. Been there 20 years now. Last year was my 20th. Wow. So, so how, how do the two, there are more than two, but how do those two parts of your life, sort of librarian at Park School and, and writer, I mean, how do those two fit? Do they fit together? They fit together. They fit together well, um, partly because the school has been, you know, amazing, really. I mean, the school staked me by letting me have the facas and um, has been unbelievably um, kind to me as, as, an, as, as a writer. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and I think I, I do need the children. I need to see them. And, uh, I wonder about and of that. course, I have used them as little audiences. Little guinea pigs for everything from jacket copy to book jackets. To, I mean, I'm always saying, well, what do you think about this? And they, they tell me. Um, the Night Fairy. I, what I didn't know is when I read them, The Night Fairy, there were some kids who would go out at recess and pretend to be the characters. That's the greatest honor. To think that That's some, you know, awesome. that some of them wanted to be the squirrel, you know, I love that. Oh, I, so, how are Park School students as an audience? What are they like? Well, it's it's to begin with. There's the thing that I noticed when I came to do children's theater is um, they're kids with that have been talking and reading and thinking and being exposed to literature from a very early mm -hmm. age. Mm -hmm. So, when I came to Park, I realized that. The students I've been telling to fourth and fifth grade, the stories I've been telling to fourth and fifth grade um, when I worked in the public library, I could now tell to second grade. No kidding. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because there's a degree of, there was an attention, attention span, you know, the, the vocabulary. And, and when I'm telling a story, you know, I might get to something beautiful or a monster or something, and I see their faces reflecting it and it sometimes makes the hair on my arm stand up because they got the story in a way that mm. is so real to them that then I start to um, well feed off sounds so parasitic. Oh no, but I absolutely but I, know what you're talking about. You know, about. it starts to come back to me mm. and what happens you know theater, there's right? that yeah and there's that, that moment of of, um, you know, there are these turning points in stories which are revelations, and you see that reflected in their faces. And of course, with young children, there's, there's also the quality of they, they didn't know it was going to happen. <laughs> Hopped along behind him, and when he turned around from making his supper, there was the hair on the floor. So he sat down at his plate. And the hair leaped up on the chair next to him and then on the table. And it sat up very daintily and looked at him. And the man burst out laughing and he said, oh, so you've come for supper. I like her reading because she makes it all, like she makes a lot of details on the story. Because like if she knew the story, she might even make it more exciting. I don't know, it'd be interesting to have her read a story to the upper schoolers, because I think we've all forgotten almost what it's like, but I just, it's, I don't know, it's nice, it's a very calming experience. And she was always just the most warm and loving person, and was so kind to everyone, it was unbelievable. She uses her voice, she uses, um, kind of creates in sound, this whole world, and the, and the, and the kids will just follow her. It's, it's, she's an amazing storyteller. Those are the Academy Awards of Children's Literature, and we've got this year's winners right here with us this morning. Laura a a Amy Schlitz is the 2008 Newbery Medal winner for her book, Good Masters, Sweet Ladies, Voices from a Medieval Village. Laura, Annie, I mean, getting it when she discovered that she, I'm sorry, you don't mind showing that picture. Look how excited you are. I know she's rolling your eyes. You actually are a school teacher. Yes. Well, you wrote these in the first person of characters from a medieval village. You wrote these things for, your, for students to act out loud in, in terms of a theatrical presentation. 
Yes, I work at the Park School. They have a very rich curriculum. And the children were already making catapults and baking bread and illuminating manuscripts, but I wanted them to have theater piece. So I wrote them these monologues. And the monologues give them a sense of what these people were like. In other words, what they wish for, what they like, what they love, what they did. In other words, it takes them and lets them live in the shoes of someone from medieval village. Right. They learn them by heart. Literally. Mm-hmm. Amazing. Well, and I know that your people kept saying, you should put these in a book. You should put these in a book. You said, oh, nobody's going to want this nobody's book. Nobody's going to And now you've thing. won this medal. <laughs> All the stars were in the right alignment. So um, you've won uh, some awards, and you won the Newbery Award. Oh, the Newbery Award. So, it's going to be on my tombstone. <laughs> so what was that like? Well, I, I, I happen to have the award oh, here. Oh, would you show? <laughs> yeah. I actually, first, you know, at the Newberry Banquet, which is like 1,200 people, uh, they give you this, wow. and you give your speech. Dear friends, a cadre of perceptive and passionate readers has decided that my book is good. This is earth-shaking. As a writer, there's nothing in the world I want more than this, that my work should be good. And now, in my joy, I am supposed to speak to you, and this is dangerous because I am apt to be both maudlin and grandiose. I must remind myself that good is an approximate term. And I gave my speech. And then afterwards, there's a receiving line, but between the receiving line and the speeches, they give you three minutes to go to the bathroom. (laughs) So I first opened this in the bathroom. (laughs) And I was so pleased that it had all these layers. That's nice. It ought to be nice. You know, and it's not fair because the people who win the honors, they get plaques. I think if I'm ever really rich, I'm going to make sure they get a medal too because, you know, the honor is really just as good in some ways and they should have a medal. Mm-hmm. You know, but yeah. anyway, that's my medal. May I, may I hold that in my yeah. hand? For the most distinguished contribution to American literature for children. Wow. That's my name on it. The camera there. That is so beautiful. It has a nice heft to it, too. Yeah, it does. No, it does. It should. For the most distinguished contribution to American literature for children. Very nice. So, um, are you looking forward to winning any more Newberry Awards? Lightning does not strike it twice. <laughs> this was amazing. This was, you know, it was an astonishment. So, uh, what's the response at Park been like um, to? To your success to, with the award and with the, with the books coming out, I mean, do kids know? Uh, that... Oh yeah, they know. Mm-hmm. And 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 I mean, the day that I won was was amazing. Mm-hmm. You know, and at about six thirty that morning, January fourteenth, two thousand and eight, uh, Hillary Jacobs called me at home and said she did it, and I screamed. My daughter, who was home for some reason, heard me, and came running down and wanted to know what was wrong. Um, the idea that Laura had won a Newbery Award was, it's not inconceivable because it was, she should have won it, she deserved it. The fact that they'd actually given it to her was unbelievable <clears throat> and, and marvelous. Seeing her that later that day, we, we couldn't wait for her to come in, and we saw her when she came in, and it was... It was a wonderful moment. The whole place exploded. It was incredible, you know, and the whole school came together um, that week and celebrated her and, you know, the phone started ringing. And, it, know, was, inter- it was pretty overwhelming to come into the gymnasium and... Oh God, I do remember that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, um, I mean, I, I didn't even want to do that at first. I felt I was you know, so happily freaked out and felt like, and I remember Michael Eanes saying, you know, you will do this because this is also the school's day to celebrate. Michael Eanes. And he was great. He was wonderful. And then, you know, to walk in and um, I think it was the paper chains that got to me. I mean, the first graders had made paper chains and they started wrapping me in paper chains. Oh. And that was... um, and then, you know, just to see, they, they were all really happy for me think, and on my side. Yeah. And that was, you know, and kids made me cards. And, um, and then what I, what I also appreciated was that after about a week, 
they'd sort of forgotten about it. Well, and like it became, your parents. And it became the place where, you know, that being with them was the place where it wasn't weird because, mm -hmm. you know, they wanted me to find them their book. Mm -hmm. And I was telling stories as I have always told stories. And um, it, what was between, what is between me and them was genuine and is genuine and did not change. Yeah, they could be both really happy for you. Yeah, and, and then... And still be exactly who they were. Yeah. That's nice. The kite in our hands in case the wind is there. When the wind comes, those are the extraordinary, the surreal times. They are worth all the other times. Can you tolerate one more metaphor? Because I should like to draw your attention to the invisible presence, the secret protagonist of the kite story, the string. I tell the story as if it's about me. I flew the kite. Then I personify the kite and it's a falcon. And then I wax rhapsodic about the wind. But the real hero of the story is the string, which stands for the connection between things. Without the string, I have no hold on the wind, and the kite falls to earth. And this is the final, the most potent reason for telling you this story. Because the Newbery Medal isn't about my book, or any book. It's about the invisible fellowship of librarians, publishers, parents, teachers, and writers who want to give their best to children. The Newbery Medal is a symbol of our communion. We are threaded together by our commitment to children and the life of the mind. We dance together on one string.